Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing that's just feeding your greed. Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it. Hey, y'all, some exciting news before we dive into this episode. The Minimalists are going to host a private podcast and live stream exclusively for our Patreon supporters. We're calling this Ask the Minimalists Anything. Anyone who contributes $2 or more over at our Patreon page can attend this special live stream. And if you can't make the live stream itself, the live session, the live podcast, don't worry. You'll still have access to the private video and the private audio podcast after it's recorded. We hope to do this at least once a quarter, maybe more frequently for our Patreon supporters. And please note that none of the money from our Patreon campaign goes to our personal bank accounts. Rather, what we're going to do is use these funds to build our own new podcast studio and a film studio, which is going to allow us to do a bunch of really cool things like take live callers on the air, improve overall audio quality, and bring guests on the show. We're also going to hire a full-time filmmaker to create a video version of this podcast. And we also want to produce a bunch of other meaningful video creations like web series, TV shows, interviews, documentaries, video essays, and more. And because we refuse to clutter our podcast with advertisements, Patreon really is the best way for us to fund these creative endeavors together. So let me ask you this. Are you willing to help? If so, please become a patron today. Head on over to patreon.com slash the minimalists, or you can go to our website. It's just the minimalists.com and click on the donate button at the top. We'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. And please know that your support is greatly appreciated together. We will create something meaningful. Hello everybody. Welcome to the minimalist podcast where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I am Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are The Minimalists. And we are live in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Hello, Grand Rapids. (laughs) What a great city. I was walking around most of the day today. And actually, we'll get to that in a little bit because we have an added value segment. We can talk about some really cool local things. But usually, we take this time to take callers. But that would be really weird. So um, instead, we have a microphone right here. And we're going to start with three sort of long-winded answers. You can ask a regular question. We'll give you a rather circuitous, maundering answer. But uh, we hope to answer your question. So someone has to break the ice and, and, and get to the mic first, and then what will happen is everyone will cascade down to it after that, and then it will be too late, because we'll do three, and then we'll do a lightning round where we'll do three plus questions. And, and Ryan and I have been, scoring. You're scoring, that is right. We're turning it into a rap battle, <laughs> except Ryan and I don't rap, so we just uh, <laughs> try to give pithy answers to your questions. So uh, if you want to come to the mic, give us your name and what your question is, and we'll be happy to do our best to answer it. How you guys doing? Andrew. Andrew. Um, I've been paring down a lot of stuff in my life, and I'm left with things like old cameras or old iPhones, stuff that I think is valuable, but it's really worthless to me. I don't want to just chuck it in the trash. So what do you suggest for trying to figure out a a good home for it? Let me ask you this. Do you you want to sell it? I really don't want to go through the hassle. I'd really like, because I have all these iPhones. I have like seven iPhones yeah. from just like every model. Uh-huh. I could have like a little collage. You could have like a museum of iPhones. I, I do. So I'd like to give it to like, you know, maybe somebody like, you know, somebody that would get some use out of it because it doesn't work like as a phone, but maybe somebody could like use it to browse the internet or, or something to that extent. Sure. I, so I he should start a museum. A museum of iPhones? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> That's one, one piece of advice. Um, but So here's the thing. With, with our electronics, one of the reasons we hold on, there are a few reasons we hold on to something like that. One is this idea of sunk costs. And it seems to me like you've gotten past that, where you're like, you realize that that $800 iPhone 2 is no longer an $800 artifact. Uh, and that's good. Most of us, however, we hold on to this thing because we're like, but I paid $800 for this. And you're like, yeah, but it's not really worth that anymore. It's worth what someone's willing to pay for. And right now, you're like, 
I don't even want to go through the hassle. So it's literally worth zero dollars to you. And in fact, it's worth less than zero because it, it's these, there's all these additional costs that go on top of the, the price tag. So if we buy something, that's usually what we think of as the cost of the thing, right? We, we think of like, well, I paid five dollars for this widget, but then we don't think about all the additional costs as well, like the cost of storing the thing, replacing the thing's batteries, changing the oil in the thing, putting gas in the thing, cleaning the thing, replacing the thing, all the time the thing takes up and eats, eats away from us. And, and then of course, losing the thing, repairing the thing, and, and there are all these additional costs. The real costs of owning a thing go way beyond the price tag. And then of course, there's, there's one other cost that you have here, and, and it's the, the cost of the space this occupies in your mind right now, where you're like, it's a burden. And, and so we have all of these additional costs, and you're experiencing one of those costs right now. And, and there are some pr practical things you can do. Most, uh, most shelters, whether it is a uh, women's shelter or a homeless shelter, there are a lot of places who will repurpose these devices. They'll do one of several things to them. Some of them will take them and sell them for you. So there is some market somewhere for your iPhone 3. And, and the question is, how much is that worth? It may be worth only 20 bucks, but to them, it's an additional $20 contribution toward their call. So someone else will get value from the thing if you part with it. Um, there, there are some other things you can do with it as well. There are some different websites, that, and on Craigslist, obviously, you can, just, you can just try to get rid of the thing. I know that's, even that is a, a bit of a hassle at some point. Um, and then other things that aren't, that you may not even be able to get rid of, you can, tend, you, you can usually recycle them. There are places that have recycling bins. I know where we are. Um, there are a couple of places. There's a donation warehouse. There's also like the local Target does. Um, they have like a bin where you can put old cell phones and old batteries as well uh, that, you, that you're no longer using. So I, I guess the point w where I'm going here is you can find a way to repurpose the thing and you actually end up saving in the long run, not saving money, but saving all of these additional costs, the, the space, the mental clutter, the internal clutter, the anxiety, and it's very low level. It's not like you're up here panicking like, oh my God, I can't live my life if I, don't, if I keep holding on this iPhone 3. It, but that's also the reason we have 300,000 items in our houses, right? Is because there's this one thing I can't figure out how to get rid of times 200,000. <laughs> and, and that's what happens. It becomes this, the, the, this little cycle of, of incremental clutter. It's a good, a good essay title cycle of incremental clutter. But that's really what, what our lives are filled with. And that's why it's important to keep asking that question of does this add value to my life? You're way past that. You've already figured out that it doesn't. Now, now the question is whose life will it add value to? Yeah, I totally feel you on the, you don't want to like nickel and dime every little thing. I remember after the packing party, I started, well, <laughs> after the packing party, I, I, I invited Josh over to like help me sort stuff. And I just remember, it was kind of quickly where he had like this big 50 gallon like garbage bag and he was just like sweeping stuff into it. And I'm like going through things one by one. Um, and I'm like, what are you doing, man? And he's like, what, what are you gonna do with these coffee mugs? I'm like, well, I, well I've got like, you know, 40 of them. Like maybe if uh, like 38 of them break, then I have like an extra two to like hang out. So I, I was very much caught in the, the just in case. But also like the nickel and diming, meaning um, my TV, for example, I had a, oh, I don't know, it was like 60 inch um, 780p, like, you know, one of the older model TVs that I had paid, uh, it was like 1200 bucks for. And I remember putting it on Craigslist uh, at first for like 700 bucks, no, no takers, like 500 bucks, no takers. Crickets. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I did that for uh, a few weeks, and finally I was just like, you know what? Like, I just if I can get all, you know two hundred bucks out of this thing, I'll be I'll be really grateful for it. And I put it on there for like two twenty five, and you know some kid came and talked me down to two hundred bucks, but he was like so happy that he got this huge TV for two hundred bucks. Like him and his girlfriend, like they just moved into together. Like he was telling me this whole story, like man, we just moved in, like we don't much. Both of our parents are talking to us because we moved in together, and. And he's like, it's so hard to like, you know, get stuff. And I'm so glad. I mean, but it felt really good to be able to like contribute to that kid's life. I mean, even though I was still charging him 200 bucks, I mean, he was, he was pretty happy about it. 
Um, and then I remember like, I, I, I had this surround sound system I paid like five or 600 bucks for. And I was selling it on Craigslist, I think for you know, 200 bucks or something. And uh, long story short, this guy talked me down to 60 bucks. And when he came to my house, he was like, I was like so excited to get, get rid of this. And he was like, all right, man, um, uh, you know, let me go ahead and see it. And like, you know, we turned it on, the speakers worked, everything was great. And he's like, all right, great, I'll take it. I'm like, awesome. And he's like, I just want the receiver. Like he didn't want to take the other speakers with it. <laughs> And he's like, I'll still give you 60 bucks. I'm like, no, dude, you bought all this. <laughs> and uh, he ended up taking everything and he was like, all right, he's like, I'll, I'll find a use for it or, you know, I'll go donate it or whatever. But I guess my point is, is like, yeah, there is a certain point where it is a sunk cost. And you've got to ask yourself, like, is it, if it's going to take me, you know, 10 hours to sell this $100 thing, I mean, it's 10 bucks an hour. Like, can I do something for 10 hours and make more than 100 bucks? And if the answer is yes, then I would just encourage you to, to donate it. I mean, you've already said that it means, well, not that it means nothing to you, but the value to you is, is, is nothing. But to someone else, that could mean a lot. Um, I had like an iPhone 4 that, um, I don't know how many models ago that was, but uh, it was something I gave away and like it, it, by that time, there were a few models that had come out after that. And I just finally had retired my iPhone 4. And uh, who I gave it to, they were like so ecstatic about, oh my God, I've never had an iPhone before. So even though like you may not see that direct result, you may not find that person, you know, who's connected with you directly, that's going to get that, that kind of benefit or joy out of it. But I promise you, man, like if you give it to one of the organizations or... Uh, that, that Josh talked about or, uh, you know, give to a goodwill or something, it will find a good home and you will be adding value to someone else's life. I mean, you may not find any value in it, but there probably is someone out there who definitely will find value in it. But at the end of the day, it is sunk cost. And you already look at, look at it like it is sunk cost. I've, I've taken them across the country, just box them up and take them from New York to Chicago <laughs> to Michigan. They've traveled more than most people in this country. That's yeah. awesome, man. You, you, you know what's interesting about that is I, I would, so it's going to take you 15 minutes to get rid of them I mean, when you think about it. Give yourself three times as much of that. Put that time on the calendar. So put 45 minutes on your calendar some point this week. Not only does that give you a deadline, but it gives you time that's allocated specifically for that. I mean, I, I think whenever, like with Ryan, when he did his packing party and we spent a whole day, I mean, really busting our asses to pack up everything in his huge house, it, it made sense to do it that day. Otherwise, it would have never gotten done. It was just scheduled and, and, and that was that. So you can do it this weekend and you'll feel incrementally freer as a result. Thank you. Thanks, brother. Thanks, man. Howdy. Hi. My What's name you? is Sophie. Hey, Sophie. Hello. Um, first of all, thank you for coming to Grand Rapids. Um, I was at your show in Boston over Easter weekend, and it was amazing. So I found the next closest one to me ah. and uh, came here. Oh, wow. <laughs> thank um, you. That is awesome. So my question is, how do I begin to let go of any stress that I might feel when I see my friends and family around me not aligning their short-term actions with their long-term goals? Yeah, so, so let me just rephrase your question a little bit because I think it's an important question. And the, the, the way I'm going to rephrase your question is um, align their actions with their, their short-term actions with their long-term values. Because I, I don't really, I'm not prescribing this to anyone else, but I don't really have goals anymore. And um, I know that's a weird thing to hear in our culture, right? <laughs> In our culture, you seem like a crazy person or a lazy person. Ryan and I are in the middle of a 40-city tour. I assure you we're not lazy. But um, we're also, um, I don't think we're that crazy. But, but um, the reason I prefer to eschew goals is I'd rather have a direction to go in than have a a goal that I'm working toward. And, and there's a reason for that. So let's say that, for example, we're, we're in Grand Rapids right now, and if, if my goal is to, to make it to San Francisco, like that's my goal, I wanna travel to San Francisco, but all of a sudden I end up in Seattle or Los Angeles instead because there's some awesome detour and I ended up in, at a better place. Well, if you have a goal, if your goal is being in San Francisco, then technically you failed, right? You, 
But if you re- achieved a better outcome, then you probably didn't fail at all. And so what I prefer to do is say, instead of I'm going to go to San Francisco, I say, oh, I'm going to head west. And I might have an ideal sort of horizon in mind, but I, I try to be flexible enough that I can end up anywhere else. And so that flexibility, first off, is key. So my question to you is, are they headed in the same direction as you? And if not, th- then it's a different conversation altogether. Sometimes they're just heading in, the, in, 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 the, in the same direction, but they get there via a different path. Because if you want to go to San Francisco from here, there's a bunch of different roads you could take, right? And, and uh, the question is, are they just taking different roads to get to the same place as you? That place, to continue the metaphor, are, are our values, right? And so uh, the reason Ryan and I get along so well is because we have similar values. But we do have different beliefs. The beliefs are the roads that get us to those values. So, for example, we voted for different people in the last election. <gasps> How could you be best friends with someone who didn't vote for the same exact person as you? Uh, or, or, you know what? Um, we, we have different personalities. He's an extrovert. I'm an introvert. He's very in the moment. I plan things out six months in advance. Um, and um, I, I'm more details oriented. He's a big picture guy. And so, uh, but we still have the same or similar, at least, values. So you want to get really clear on what your values are? First, I think that's the most important step. Uh, you can go back and listen to a podcast we recorded about values. It was episode number 69, I believe. And um, it's about, someone laugh at that? It's, <laughs> yes, it's episode 69, I get the reference. Um, okay, uh, anyway, I probably shouldn't have paid that any mind. Real mature, man. Oh. <laughs> I couldn't help it. Anyway, um, uh, once you get clear on, on what your values are, and then you can start talking to them in a way that's not like, hey, what are your values? Because then you're going to get the deer in headlights thing that Ryan was talking about during his talk. Like, you're just going to be like, they're going to look at you like, you're, what do you mean, what are my values? And you want to get clear on yours, and you want to help other people uncover theirs without saying, here are your values. But you can start to identify what theirs are. And if you're heading in d- different directions, Sometimes you go in different directions from someone, and that's okay. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, 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 I've never dragged anyone. Why well, I, I have it now. I mean, but in the past, like, I felt like that was the right thing to do. Like, well, if you don't believe what I believe, then I better hold on to you and drag you kicking and screaming until you know that I'm right. Well, how does that work out for anyone? I mean, even now, we're not out here telling people that we're not proselytizing. I don't want to convert you to minimalism. By the way, I don't think that's possible. Like, I just want to share a recipe that's worked really well for me, and I've seen that a similar recipe work really well for thousands of other people. And, and in doing so, me heading in that direction, a lot of people are willing to follow because they see the value in that as well. And so even people who thought I was crazy, when I, first, when I, when I walked away from the corporate world, so um, I, I walked away and... Every, Everyone was asking me, like, what competitor are you going to? And can you take me with you? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm just going to go write. Like, I wanted to write fiction full time. That was my whole thing. I was going to work at a local coffee shop. And, and then this whole thing happened, and it was a beautiful accident. But um, I, I found that some of those people, like, said, well, it's just, it's crazy. If you're, you can't just, like, go pursue what your dreams are. And, and I said, well, maybe you can't, but I've chosen to, right? And you can't only because you're, you're saying that you can't, and you have a limiting belief there, and, and so did I for a long time. And I'm going to start walking in this direction. And they're like, yeah, whatever, this guy's crazy. He'll be back or whatever. And the truth is, six, seven years later, they're calling me asking for advice. And that's because... I continued to go in a direction where I knew my actions were aligned with the person that I wanted to be. That's my short answer. <laughs> um, I, gotta, I, I have one question before I answer your question. Did you say when you hang out with people and their actions don't align with their values or don't align with your values? With what their values? What their values are. Might be, might be. So... Okay, so I've got like, 
some friends and family who, uh, and I'm probably guilty of this at some point, where I'm like, man, I really should do X. And uh, my actions are completely different than what, like, I would love to become vegan again, for example. Right? <laughs> Don't applaud me yet. <laughs> Because I just had some, like, a delicious lobster roll earlier today. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, my point is, is, like, I would one day uh, like to go back to those principles. I have not made it a priority yet. And I'll tell you, uh, the best thing that anyone can do for me, Josh, who I'd probably see more than anyone, is, is to support me and to, and to really go out of their way to accept who I am and not try and, you know, force me into whatever that may be. I mean, at the end of the day, um, if, someone wa- if someone says, oh, well, you know, I shouldn't, uh, I shouldn't uh, put things on my credit card anymore, and then you see them going out to lunch and they put things on their credit card, like, to say to them, hey, wait a minute, you said you weren't gonna put any things on your credit card anymore. Like that is the worst approach to take because A, you're embarrassing them, B, you're making them feel guilty and that's always gonna cause a little bit of resentment. I mean, th- that's just the road to not go down for sure. So I, I guess- uh, Unless that's what they're asking for. Well, yeah, I, I, unless I also it, know yeah, Ryan. that's true, that's true. And, and if, if he was like, hey, Josh, I'm gonna become a vegan tomorrow, he would say something like, if you ever see me eat a piece of meat, slap it out of my hand. Right. So they, it's that, ask me what they want, though. Right. So that so maybe maybe the answer is 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 to not ask us what to do, but ask that person what to do. And you know, the next time you hear that person say, "Oh man, I, you know, this is really what I want to be," then you can ask them, like, "Hey, what can I do to help you to get there?" And that's what a good friend does, and that's what a loving person does. And I'm sure the people you're talking about. You know, you love them, you want them to be happy, and in that case, you will support them. And at the end of the day, just ask them how to support them. Uh, but certainly calling them out and, uh, yeah, trying to, trying to be their, you know, authoritative uh, figure is not going to, it's not going to get you lasting results, if any results at all. Yeah, and one, one last thing. Uh, surround yourself with some mentors, uh, people who... I'm not saying that are like actual mentors where you're like, I want you to be my mentor. That's usually not how mentorship works. But, but um, we often think it is. Like, I'm going to reach out to this person and tell them I want... I Because want, if, if someone comes to me and says, can you be my mentor? I'm just thinking like, shit, how much work do I have to do? <laughs> but I also know that like I'm a mentor to a lot of people in different capacities, right? And so surround yourself with people whom you aspire to be like people who are older than you and people who are younger than you as well who have who have different perspectives different personalities different beliefs you know i uh, i encourage you to find the, those different paths so you can so you can continue to figure out and make sure that you personally are on on the right path thank you thanks for being here thanks howdy hi i'm amy and and I may have made the Dutch Mafia comment. Um, and I apologize because as I'm standing in line, I probably ignored all the things you said for the last two people that were in line because I was focused on my things. So um, I apologize also if I get emotional a little bit. Um, my dad died two weeks ago. Wow, I'm sorry. Um, it's okay. Um, but I am a grandchild of Depression era grandparents and um, they saved everything and my parents when they died when my grandparents died saved their things and now that my parents are di- my, my dad passed away I have three generations of things that I am going through and um, I come from a hoarding background a little bit and so I already, ho- I already have my stuff my stuff um, so my question, my question is, I don't know if I have a question, it's just how, how, how do I handle all of this? My, my, my dad passed away, my rock, my best friend. Um, I'm handling all of this. My mom has dementia and I'm handling all of that. 
And on top of that, I have their stuff. Yeah. I have eight boxes of pictures in my living room right now because I had to go through them. And they're sitting in my living room. How do I handle that? Well, let me, let me ask you a, a question first, and it's an important one. What the fuck is the Dutch Mafia? <laughs> you gotta tell me. I have no clue. We save money and save things, and we wear wooden shoes. <laughs> okay. And they're super cheap. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so... We are Hollanders, and we like it. <laughs> I asked that question specifically for a reason. It was to change your state a little bit, right? Yeah. And, and to make you smile a little bit. Because I can tell you, it's, I, I understand how overwhelming and how, how saddening um, that experience is. You know, I went through it my, myself. Both of my parents ha have passed at this point. And, and I can tell you the most important thing for you to do right now is, is A, not be isolated, and B, find ways to change your state short term. And that can mean change your physiology. I just stood up out of my chair. That's one of the ways that you can change your physiology right away. When I used to manage a bunch of employees and they, they come in, because I manage, you know, I manage a bunch of retail stores, 150 retail stores, which is really ironic for a minimalist. <laughs> um, I wouldn't do that again. In fact, that's why I left, because it didn't align with, with my values. And, and, but when I was managing them, it was a bunch of like, hormonal 21, 22 year olds. And so they're you know, constantly either manic or depressed. And, or and, both at the same time. Yeah, yeah, well, within an eight hour yeah. shift for sure. <laughs> and, and so like they would, ah, oh, my boyfriend just broke up with me. And I'm like, look, here's what you gotta do. Um, I want you to go in the bathroom right now. Lock the door. Look in the mirror with the biggest smile you've ever made. Put that smile on your face, and I want you to jump up and down for 10 seconds in the mirror. No one's going to see you, but if you do that and you come out, then I'll keep talking to you about this, this issue. And I know it sounds crazy at first until you try it. And it is, it's not crazy, but it's stupid. You're going to be like, what, what the hell am I doing, right? Like, I just got this big smile, and I'm jumping up and down. But all of a sudden, you feel that, like, it's impossible for you in that moment, not long term, but in that moment for you to feel that same level of sadness or depression or anger or frustration or overwhelm because we have the phys physiology to actually change that. And so, so when I started teaching that to, to different employees, um, I saw that their results were better after they went and did that. It had nothing to do with, with like the, you know, I mean, I was happy that like maybe it helped them through a, you know, a moment where they were feeling sad about a breakup, but their results in real life, you know, for them, it was like they were doing better during their work shift. But I found that the same for me, when I change first my physical state, and then I change what language I'm using around, instead of I'm overwhelmed by stuff, may maybe you start saying things like, um, I miss my father, but I realize that he's not in these things. And if you start changing the language around these, these things, you'll find that it's A, easier to let go, but B, it becomes necessary to let go because these things aren't doing anything for you except giving you those negative emotions. And we, we both know your father wouldn't want you <laughs> to experience that at all. Man. Um so it's been only like two weeks. So this is, this is hard. This is really hard. And I don't want to, there's nothing I can say to make it easy. Um, in fact, regardless, I guess, of where someone sits with uh, something that you've had to go through or whether they're sitting with a horde of things in their house, I mean, there isn't really an easy answer. Um, I mean, that's why in the beginning, I'm like, hey, I'm talking about a deliberate life. It's not a perfect life or even an easy life, but a simple one. And unfortunately, I think we, we look at simple and we find it synonymous with easy. And it's, it's not. It, it is a very difficult thing. So I guess like the first piece of advice I would say to you is wait, wait until wait until some time has passed and you're ready to like go through everything. Um, 
but you're going to have to come up with a plan on how to deal with all this stuff, whether it is with other family members or whether it's with friends. You certainly need to have some kind of support and some help to go through all of this. But I think that's where it starts is coming up with a plan. So like the pictures, for example, um, I know that like I used to have boxes and boxes of pictures. And when I went through and I'm like, okay, I'm going to scan. I'm going to go ahead and scan all these pictures. Yeah. Like <laughs> as long as you call it. I a, spent two and a half hours at Kinko's for like a fraction. Yeah. And, and it's, it was like $40. I'm just putting it on. Yeah. 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 And, and it's like. And I'm Dutch. Yeah. <laughs> so that's like a million dollars in, exactly. in Dutch terms. I got you. Um, <laughs> well, you know, uh, even though Josh was like, hey, let's have a scanning party, which putting the party at the, at the end of anything. <laughs> I mean, it sounds fun and you, and you got me hooked, but it's still. Only if drinks are involved. Right. I was going to say, I'll bring the beer. Uh, but no, I mean, it, it still was a lot of work. Um, but what I'll say is when I was going through uh, a lot of those pictures, um, there were a lot of them I didn't feel like I needed to hold on to. And I'm not going to put an amount on there because I think that's going to be different for everyone. But um, yes, you spent two and a half hours at Kinko's. You've got a bunch of scanned pictures. You have more things to go through. You're going to have to spend another weekend, two and a half hours at Kinko's, another million dollar, a million Dutch dollars to, to spend there. Another mortgage on my home. You, you mortgage know, or or you can just buy a, a cheap scanner. I mean, that, that's definitely <laughs> what I'd recommend, and it'll yeah, save you money. That's probably the way to do it. Yeah, it, it was just a, you can go to our website, and we can show you exactly like those same scanner that Ryan, so if you go to theminimalists.com slash scanning, Ryan, this scanning part. Marketing. Party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, I'm not advertising anything. <laughs> it's, it's our website, no, and it's it, free. Yeah, um, you don't have to get a scanner. You can keep spending forty bucks every time you go no, to Kinko's. No, no, I we don't care. This. I <laughs> no, no, but it, you know, at the end of the day, um, it's. I I wish I could be like, you know what? Grab our three books on your way out and watch our documentary, and you'll know exactly what to do. Um, that's not really how it works. I mean, it, it's going to take time, and it is going to take a plan, and it's going to take a lot of action on your on your part, and the people around you to to help implement that plan. I, I guess, like, the one thing I want to throw out there is, like, give yourself, you know, however long you need. I mean, there will be a point where, like, you're never going to want to do it. So if I sit here and say wait until you feel ready, like, you're never going to feel ready. But you're going to get to a point where it's going to be, it's going to go from, like, s being upset to you have to take action. It's going to start being more and more stressful. Uh, you know, when you know, you, you know, when you get to that point, like, don't put it off or set a date a month from now or two months from now, whatever you think would work. I mean, that would be even better to set something up ahead, but yes, it's going to, it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a plan and it's going to take time. There's no doubt about it. Um, but I guess the one thing I will definitely encourage you to keep doing is asking these questions and continuing to, to take these small steps towards filtering through all this stuff. The worst thing you can do is get a storage unit and just put it all in there and ignore it. That is that is the last thing. That's been contemplated. Yeah, so. don't do that. That's, that's not gonna make you feel any better. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, but before we, before we move on, um, anyone who's listening to this at, at home, if you have a comment or tip for anyone who has asked a question so far today or anyone else who does, you can leave us a voicemail at 406-219-7839 or send us a voice memo from your phone at podcast at theminimalists.com and we will air our favorite comments and tips on a future episode. Ryan, do you know what time it is? You know what time it is. What? It is time for our hashtag Ask the Minimalists lightning round. Yeah. Nice. We are on uh, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook at The Minimalists. And during the lightning round, this is where we, we do our best to answer the questions with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. And the problem with that is we usually have a week to prepare our answers to your questions. And now we have, instead of seven days, we have like seven seconds. 
So we'll do our best, but we'll probably, we'll probably maunder on a bit and eventually come up with a, a pithy answer for you. Howdy, what's your name? Hi, my name is Katie. Hey, Katie. And I'm going to break the rules. I actually have two questions. Hopefully you can sum them up in one pithy answer. Oh, um, man, the first, very the first relatable. questions are very challenging. <laughs> Challenge One answer accepted. with two questions. All right. The first question is, before you quit your corporate jobs, did you plan for your retirement? Um, when someday you don't want to do any work anymore. And my second question is, how often do you do laundry? <laughs> oh, man. Um, <laughs> I have a pithy answer, but I want you to go first. All right, so, so the first question had to do with retirement. And so how do we mix re retirement and laundry into one response for you? Oh, man. I was, all right, I'll give you my pithy answer. This is kind of lame, but this is like, this is kind of my, uh, all right, so once a week I do laundry, and once a month I contribute to my retirement account. Oh, that is good, man. I'm not even right. fucking finished. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to ruin your own answer. Both are non-negotiable. Ah, yeah. There's a little bit of applause there. I heard someone. I heard someone. Woo! Yeah. I got applause and one. Woo! All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, but before I left the corporate world, yeah, absolutely, I, I contributed just to my 401k out of out of every paycheck, and um, you know, in fact, if you want to see, this is not my pithy answer, but if you, if you want to see my net worth down to my pen, down to the pennies give or take some market fluctuations, um, you can just go to the minimalist.com slash retirement. That's yeah, I think that's one. it. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, and you can see like, exactly what, what I, how I allocate my, my retirement. And you also learn that we're certainly not millionaires. Um, but um, not that there's anything wrong with being a millionaire for the millionaires in the room. Wait, Congrat I thought... Congratulations to you. I thought, once, I thought once we got on Netflix, we were millionaires. <laughs> Unless you're hiding some money from me. This is going to be a whole different documentary 20 years from now. Um, and so... And also in the corporate world, I, I own 70 Brooks Brothers dress shirts. So I never did laundry then. <laughs> uh, but, uh, God, man, your answer was so solid. You can concede. I will concede this one. <laughs> yes! Uh, yeah. But, but I, I don't know how that makes me feel. They applauded louder to your conceding. I think you kind of won that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I will tell you, uh, my answer is actually the same as Ryan's. I, I still plan for... for um, I don't know if you'd call it retirement now. I feel retired now, and it's awesome. But I plan for the future, right? Whether that's right. home ownership someday, or or emergency fund, which is important. Um, so there's some some pithy truism about fail to plan and plan to fail. But I won't I won't I won't deploy that one since I've already conceded. Thank you very much for your question. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Howdy. Hello. Maybe this is related to the Netflix thing that's coming out in 20 years, but I'm curious about um, like strategies you have maybe, just even with each other, you get more successful, you mark more money, things are looking good, and how do you like control yourself and not, you know, like, oh shit, easy, take this vacation, buy this thing, do that thing that you weren't about you know, that's about the whole minimalist lifestyle. You know, just curious about that. Like, how do you? So, what are you gonna do once you're a millionaire, a Josh? Yeah. 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 So, so my, I'll give my short answer first, but then I'll, I'll try to expand on it. It's just three words. Contribution is key, and, and I think that's what's important because back in, in back when I made several hundred, I made two hundred thousand dollars a year in the corporate world, which sounds awesome, but I, I made good money, but spent even better money. And that equation does not work at all. And so I had massive amounts of debt. So I'm debt free now, which is, which is really nice. Thank you. And, and now, whenever we get a chance to have more resources, whether it's time or attention or money, 
we find ways to invest in people. So we've gone out of our way to, to do some, some pretty cool stuff. Uh, whether it's bring people onto our team. Like we do this tour now and we used to do events for free because we could show up at a coffee shop and 20 or 30 people would be there. And that was awesome. Like, oh my God, why would 20 people come to see us? And, and now it's like, well, now we have to like have a theater and we have to have security and a staff. And, and we uh, have um, podcast Sean here who's recording it. Ladies and gentlemen, podcast Sean. We love you, Sean. He is the man behind the minimalism. He's our, our tour manager, our podcast producer, and all around outstanding guy. We also have Jessica Williams somewhere around here. Uh, oh, she she's is. right here in the second row, hiding out. And um, Jessica does all of our, our social media. She also runs a, a nice little podcast of her own called the, the Mind Palace. You can check it out. Her and, and Melissa Kane. They, they're sort of like the the younger, the, the, like the, the Gen Y. I guess they're, they're called millennials now. The millennial... Uh, female version of the Minimalists podcast, although they started their podcast way before we, we started ours. So um, you can check that out. And so we, we bring her on the road. She helps out with uh, social media and, and uh, she straightens Ryan's hair. You said you would not talk about that <laughs> in front of hundreds of people. Oh, I thought you said to talk about it. Oh. Uh, yeah, anyway, um, uh, but she does a lot of great stuff for us while we're on the road. But we, we have an entire team of people now. But beyond that, we find ways to contribute to, to different communities. And, and I find that that's important. So last year, we built a elementary school for 66 kids in Laos. Uh, we funded a high school for a year in Kenya. When the uh, Thank you. Um, and, and we've done a bunch of things on top of that. So, so we... we um, the Pulse nightclub shooting, we found a way to do a charity event down there and, and help the 52 living survivors of, of that terrible shooting. Um, we tried to help them as well. Thank you. And right now, did you, know, well, did you know that of all the people who have ever lived on Earth, half of them have died from malaria? 50% of people who have ever lived died have died from malaria. And so uh, this month we're, we're doing something interesting. We're actually looking for, for people's help. Uh, for every review we get on our podcast, which helps the message get out to more people, a uh, review on iTunes that we get, w Ryan and I are donating 10 bucks to the Against Malaria Foundation. It takes about $3,500 to buy a lifetime of insecticide-treated nets to save one life. So you get about two to five bucks per net, but over a course of a life, it takes $3,500. And so, $3,500 literally saves one, someone's life. So if we get, you know, every, there's more than 350 people here tonight. If everyone were here, here tonight left a review, we'd find a way to save at least one life. And so I like to do things like that, but also encourage other people to contribute because Ryan and I can only give so much. And so find other ways to get people involved, whether it's locally in their community with uh, food ki soup kitchens or, or food banks or Habitat for Humanity or any of these other places where you can contribute to your community in a meaningful way, I, I think that's important. And so contribution is key. Man, you would have thought I would have thought of something by now. <laughs> um, you know, I just, I really love the contribution aspect that uh, Josh and I have been able to do, especially in... 2015, um, like we, <clears throat> I have a friend who has a nonprofit coffee shop in Pak Song, Laos. Like it's the middle of nowhere for all intents and purposes. Like it's one main paved road and there's a bunch of dirt roads that shoot off of it. It's just like village after village after village. And they all are coffee farmers. And uh, yeah, long story short, like he opened up this coffee restaurant, um, ca a cafe, where all the proceeds go towards uh, building wells and toilets and like whatever like these villages need. And when uh, he talked about how he was trying to build a school, like it was so cool to be like, oh, dude, like we can help you do that. Like how much does it cost to build a school in Laos? And it was like 15,000 bucks, which is I mean, between the, the, you know, the folks that we have visiting our website and Josh and I, um, it was, it was, um, it, it didn't take long to raise 15,000 bucks and going over there and like looking at the school that they had, which was, it was like a two room shack, 
uh, two rooms, and there was a wall dividing it this high. So, like, you had... For people listening, it's like four feet. If yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Three and a half feet, but whatever. But no, it's like, it was like, and it was like a size of like a quarter of this stage. Uh, not very big at all. And the teachers had to talk over each other when they were giving lessons because like there wasn't like a full wall. And when it rained, they canceled school because it was dirt floors and like it would be, I mean, it was just like, um, man, I mean, just like really, you know, kind of grounded me a little bit. Like, wow, like this is what kids learn in and it's 2015. Uh, the school we built, it was a four room cement, like very nice roof. They were like super excited about the toilets. Like in this shack, there were no, there was no outhouse even. And in this new school, like they had, you know, a boys and girls outhouse and they were like, thank you so much for these toilets. And I'm like, wow, like, I mean, this feels really good. I mean, I would love to do more of that stuff. I remember uh, when I was, um, they do like this whole, uh, the village gets together and they do this whole like party ceremony for you. Like just basically to say, hey, thanks for, you know, coming out here and, and doing this stuff and, and, and making this possible. And uh, I remember, well, first off, like there's a translator, right? So everything I say, I have to wait a few seconds and then they translate it. And of course, I'm like trying to like crack some jokes and none of them are landing. <laughs> I mean, they were funny jokes. These people just had no... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's, it's hard to translate in, you know, uh, uh, my jokes into other people's languages. I learned that, you know, public speaking 101 there. Like, don't try to crack jokes when someone's translating for you. Um, but there was a point, though, where uh, I was like, you know, thank you so much for doing this ceremony. And the whole time, like, they were from, you know, I got from the translator, the whole time they're like, oh, thank you for the American money and the Americans coming out here and giving us their money and making this possible. And when I, when I was telling them, I'm like, you know, thanks for all this recognition. I'm like, but at the end of the day, like, it's the community that made this happen. The money, like, that was the easy part. Like, you guys coming together and building the school, building the toilets, getting together and, like, make all of this happen, like, that is what we lack in the States and that every single person got like I saw everyone oh yeah no you guys no community there <laughs> so I mean that's why Josh and I do this really is uh, we really want to contribute um, ultimately I think we really want to bring communities together and I guess uh, if I had to give a short answer I would say well, all that aligns with my values and beliefs, right? So I guess what I would say is uh, every day I try to be the best version of myself five years from now. That's all I got, yeah. Thank you. I think I tied it up there. It means we have time for one more. I want to apologize to anyone else who's in line, but I know we have to move on eventually to kick us out but we have we have a tiebreaker sir what is your name jason what's up guys what's How's up going, brother so no pressure right That's yeah right. all right so uh quick backstory last summer my wife and i sold our house and nearly everything inside it to pursue a minimalistic lifestyle so during that process we had to convince our friends and family that we weren't batshit crazy <laughs> So, since then, my question is, emotionally, how do you navigate just in case when purging sentimental gifts that you've collected over the years from those people, and how do you communicate to them that you no longer need that shit? <laughs> You really want us to wrap this up with a bow. Like, what is the tweet that I can show them that will, uh, that will inoculate me from their criticism? So this is like stuff they've bought you, you're saying? Or yeah. it's just stuff in general? So it's like, so we sell the house and all of the shit from Art Van and Williams and Sonoma. All the, all the shit on our wedding registry, right? So we have... <laughs> right? So like, yeah. in three years, we sold... $25,000 worth of shit. 
But, wow. But Congratulations, though. Oh, That's thanks. awesome, man. That's great. You know, but you keep the random dumb thing that your mom gave you 10 years ago because if she finds out you sold it in the garage sale, she'd kill you. So how, how do you like, and she knows this, this process you're going through, so how do you communicate to her that it's like, mom, I'm never gonna use this, I'm never gonna set it out, guests don't care that it's there, so how do you get them comfortable with you getting rid of it because you really don't want it, and then how do you get them to stop buying you more of it every Christmas? Man. <laughs> Wait, that's kind of two questions. I, I'm, Are we I'm, going... I'm thinking about, um, <laughs> I got married when I was way too young to get married, and um, we got three bread makers <laughs> at that, and I don't eat bread. Dude, I thought you wanted to start a bakery. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so three different bread makers, all the, actually the same bread maker, but there was just three of them on the table. And to me, that was sort of like the perfect metaphor for consumerism, like, and obligatory gift giving in particular, right? right? And so it's really two sides of the equation. What you're saying is, how do I get rid of the stuff and communicate that, but then how do I prevent this from happening in the future? Although they go hand in hand. And the future thing is start setting the expectation now. Don't tell people what you don't want. I don't want any more bread makers. Hey, if Ryan came to me and said, what do you want for Christmas? I'm not gonna say, I don't want a bread maker. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll get you something else that you don't want then. Instead, tell them what you do want. And that could be experiences. It can be tickets. It could be, uh, do you have kids? No, so that's, that's part of it. We sold everything because we made the decision to not have kids. Okay. Got a vasectomy a couple of weeks ago. Congratulations. <laughs> so, so uh, sorry, sorry, buddy. Right, TMI, right? So for, for us, for us um, traveling in those life experiences are going to be our kids. Yeah, I love yeah. it. So, so I, I mean, I think a vasectomy is the truest form of minimalism. <laughs> you, you, you quickly jettisoned the condoms. Saving money already. Yeah, there you go. Um, that, that's my pithy answer. Good night, everybody. <laughs> no, so, so I, mean, I, think, I think it's about... Um, uh, so, so uh, it has something to do with expectations here. So, so um, before you let go, set expectations with yourself and others would be my short answer. Um, my my uh, rant on my, my sh short rant on that would just be that, um, man, it, the people in your life they want you to be happy. They care about you. They want to be supportive if they do care about you, right? And you need to find a way to communicate how you need their support. Because right now, they don't understand. Um, and it's going to be different for each person, by the way. And for some people, it's as easy as a talk. I know with Ryan, if he came to me and said, I got you another bread maker, I'd be like, Ryan, stop it. What are you doing? And, and, and he would do the same thing to me because we have that type of relationship. Other people in my life, I'd be like, oh, that is such a nice thought. And, and I, first of all, I'd never let it get to that point in the first place. Everyone in my life knows not to buy me a bread maker at this point. But, but if, if they ever did for some reason, they had some delusion. Uh, I've also done a good enough expectation setting job at this point that, that if they come to me and know I, I, I'm not going to find value in something, they're not going to feel offended, at least long term, uh, by me letting go. And, and so uh, I, I would just say, yeah, just uh, let go. Before you let go, set proper expectations. Thank you. Oh, man, I was visiting my grandmother. Uh, I think it was, like, Jan it was beginning of this year, January, February. And uh, when I was leaving, she like came up to me with this 
gift bag. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh shit. Like, <laughs> all right, grandma's gonna give me a gift. Okay. And I was, I was like, I don't know how I'm gonna deal with this. I'm just gonna like, I'm just gonna, gonna be honest without being a, a dick. <laughs> And she's like, here, I got you this gift. Before you leave, I just want you to know I'm thinking of you. And I'm like, thanks, Oma. She's my German grandmother, so like first generation, so I call her Oma. I'm like, thanks, Oma. And uh, I pull this like paperweight globe. <laughs> like literally, it's a paperweight globe. <laughs> out of the bag. And I'm like, <laughs> and I just kind of look at her and I'm like, this is really Wait, nice. it was literally a paperweight? Globe. But like... Like you could shake it and it would do stuff and it would also put weight on your papers. <laughs> like, we use that pejoratively, right? Like, oh, that thing's just a paperweight now. <laughs> but the actual purpose of this thing was a paperweight. Yeah. Perfect metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> and it had like some beautiful little saying in it like... You are your dreams. Or, I don't know something. It was it was nice thought. So I'm like looking at this, and she and she was like, oh, you know, she's like, I know you don't like a lot of things in your life. She's like, but here's the thing. Yeah, here's here. <laughs> I know you don't like a, a lot of things in your life, but here's the thing. <laughs> you have your own business that you're running. And I am sure that you are surrounded by papers. <laughs> um, I don't even know where to begin with my grandparents on explaining to them how they could digitize everything. I mean, I don't even know where that conversation starts with her. But uh, I'm like, I'm like, Oma, this is a beautiful gift, and like, I can tell that you really, you really thought about me when you gave me this. It's gorgeous, but I'm not gonna have any use for this. And you know, I would really love to find someone else who could use this. And she was like, that's okay. She was like, I just, I just wanted to get you something and if you could find someone else to use it, like, that, would, that would be great. And I felt really good about that interaction with her. Um, she was happy to give it to me. Um, I definitely showed appreciation for it, um, but at the end of the day, I was like completely honest with her. I'm just like, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna like take this, and be like, oh, nice, and then go home and just get rid of it. And she would never know. Right. But you know, I, I didn't want to like hide anything from her. Um, she, it did not hurt her feelings. I guarantee it. <laughs> um, and 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 she still loves me, and uh, I. But she probably won't get me a paperweight again. Right. But the thing is, if I wasn't honest with her, you know what she might do. Just be like, you probably got multiple stacks of paper. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> I've got this other paperweight you're going to love. So I kind of nipped that in the bud right away. Um, but at the end of the day, if I took that from her, so she gave me a gift to be happy. She wanted me to be happy with that gift. If I went home with that and I held on to it out of sentimental reason, if I held on to it because I, I thought that that's what she wanted me to do, but at the end of the day it made me um, unhappy, to hold on to that. It's kind of doing a disservice to my grandma. I mean, at the end of the day, like she gave that to me to be happy. And if it's making me unhappy, like if I gave you a paperweight and you were like unhappy with it, I feel like a big jerk. I would just be like, oh, well just get rid of it. Go donate it or get rid of it or something, man. I don't want you to be unhappy. And I know that's how my grandma feels too. So anyone that gives you a gift and the gift is causing stress in your life, I promise you, that that person does not want to cause you stress. So at that point, it's okay to find that thing a new home, even if someone gifted it to you. Because at the end of the day, they want you to be happy. That's why they gave you the gift. And if not having the gift makes you happy, I assure you, they don't want you to hold on to it. Um, the other thing too, thank you, that's one applause. I just need 20 more to win this. No, um, I think at the end of the day, anyone who is offended by you getting rid of something that you gave them, 
that's on them, man. That's a pro that's them projecting this insecurity of, oh my God, I didn't know what to get this person. And you know what? They didn't. And that's okay. It doesn't make them a bad person. That also doesn't mean that they have to, you know, be mean to you because, because you got rid of their thing. Um, I guess my short answer would be, as an adult, you get to choose what to do with your things. Yeah. If I could give a, another short answer here. Um, don't be burdened by other people's burdens. All right, Joe. Well, let's, uh, let's move on a little bit. Thanks for your question, brother. Appreciate You're welcome. it. Appreciate Thank you, it. guys. So, uh, are we hugging or what? Yeah, dude. Hell yeah, we you are. want to hug right now? Come get one. <laughs> Bring it in. Place. I'll sing some uh, whole lot of love while um... <laughs> Those hugs are free and transferable afterward, but we're not done yet. We're still we're still recording. Thanks Jason. Appreciate it brother. Um, so um, we should probably move on to our added value segment. So we usually talk about like things that have added value to our lives recently, and this is the part where I just recommend the most recent Drake album or something. <laughs> but uh... <laughs> I heard someone go, <laughs> Hey, we love Drizzy, I'm just saying. <laughs> Uh, but since we are, we're, we're in a, a different city, we get to, you know, only, we're only here for a day or two, we go to most places, so we try to find great coffee, great food, museums, etc., and, and then we have a chance to talk about it. So Ryan, what has been adding value to your life today, or while we've been in Grand Rapids? Oh man, um, Fish Lads, where I got the lobster roll. God, for, I had no idea I could get a lobster roll in Michigan. <laughs> And it was freaking good. Dude, we're right by the water. <laughs> uh-huh. Also, I went to, uh, oh no, Mad Cab. Cap. You hear that? Yeah, wait, is it Mad Cab or Cap? Cap. That's what I said, Cab. I know. No, Mad Cab, if you haven't been there, holy sh good coffee in, 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 in the Midwest, man. Like, yeah. Well, I mean, there's awesome coffee in the Midwest, don't get me wrong. But like Grand Rapids, we were here in 2014, and it was a great city. Don't get me wrong. We just didn't make it to Mad Cab that time, I don't think. No, but uh, three years later, dude, this city has like totally raised its game. Like, yeah. yeah. So yeah, Mad Cab. Fish Lads. Both of which are at the downtown market. Yeah. That place is great. Really cool place. But two excellent places. If you are a coffee lover like Josh and I are, we are connoisseurs. Speaking of coffee, uh, we did a bit of a coffee tour today. Uh, my partner, Rebecca, is, is with me. She's somewhere in the audience. Uh, she was hiding out somewhere. She's, she's shy, so she probably won't say hi. But hello, Rebecca. Um, and. Uh, uh, and Jess was with us too, and we took uh, the bus over to the West Side. Which, by the way, you learn a lot about a city when you, when you, yeah, West Side. Um, and you learn a lot about a city when you take a bus. So first thing I recommend is if you live here locally and you haven't been on the bus in a while, like I know that most people who live in, in, a, in a place don't take a bus if they have a car, do it. It's it's okay. And 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 you you learn a lot about about a city, you get to interact with people, and you get to go places where you may not go. And so uh, we headed over to the west side, we went over to uh, Ferris Coffee, which is great. And then I got more coffee at um, uh, Roasters. Yeah, they have a new shop on the west side now. Uh, I'd been to the one uh, over here. So anyway, um, I went there, and man, I got some awesome sushi. ATO, is that a place? Yeah, there's one person like, I like sushi. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So th th I guess those would be my recommendations. Check them out, especially if you're if you're listening to this at home and you're coming through Grand Rapids. There are three great coffee recommendations for you and some really great food. Oh, and Real Food Cafe. 
Holy moly. I think I had the best omelet of my life this morning. It was so good. Anyway, um, we should probably move on to, to right here, right now. So we talk about yes. what's going on in the lives of the minimalists. So but before we get that, to that, we'll, after we're uh, about 20 minutes after the event's over, Ryan and I will be out front. We'll be dishing out hugs, signing books, taking photos, and, and all of that fun stuff. If any of you took photos tonight and you want to share it uh, online, you can just use the hashtag less is now. That's the name of the tour. And um, we will reshare some of our favorites, or at least Jess will. She'll find some good ones and, and post those. Speaking of the tour, if you're listening to this at home, we're in the middle of a 40-city tour right now. We're coming to a city really close to you. And if you'd like to see us, you can. We'll give a talk about minimalism. We will record a live version of the podcast like we're doing right now. You can find all the cities and dates over at lessisnow.com. And also, we refuse to clutter our podcast with advertisements. And so if you, if you, if you do want to help us, um, we, have, we just set up a Patreon account. If you want to help support us, we like a dollar or two an episode. It, none of the money goes to me or Ryan, by the way. It, we're building a new podcast studio and a film studio so we can create some meaningful video creations. And also we can, so we can pay Sean, podcast Sean, a full-time living wage, support his whole family. Yeah, thank you. And even if there's any money left over from all of that, none of that goes to me or Ryan either. We'll, we'll donate any of the additional proceeds to charity. So if you, if you want to help us out, if you want to help us create something meaningful, we're not going to put advertisements on there, but we could really use your help with that. You can just go to theminimalists.com and you can click on the little donate icon at the top. You can find our, our Patreon page right there. I know you paid to get in here and, and we certainly appreciate that because it allows us to, to pay the staff, the venue and everyone else. And Ryan and I don't make any money from touring. But you spent more than your money to come here tonight. You, you gave up your two most precious resources for a few hours, your time and your attention. And we're grateful for that. And uh, you know, I don't know where, where you're going from here, but if you leave here with, with just one message after all of this, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll see some of you at least out in, in the lobby after this. We'll, we'll take about a 20 minute, 25 minute break or so, and then we'll be out there. But if you leave here with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for being here, y'all. Hi, my name is Dan, and I wanted to offer something for Margot from episode 89, who was talking about managing fear uh, while going through changing in terms of giving up belongings she had attachments to. And it reminded me of a quote from Trina Paulus. And the quote goes, How does one become a butterfly, she asked. You must want to fly so much that you are willing to give up being a caterpillar. And it reminds me that uh, in order to fully grasp something new, you're going to have to let go of something else. Hi, my name is Kristen. I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. I wanted to comment on the previous podcast in terms of not necessarily having to make a massive salary in order to save. It's not always what you have coming in financially, but how much you have flowing out. Someone can make half a million a year and spend a million, or you can make 25000 a year and spend 15000 And look at that, you're actually able to save a lot more. Uh, living paycheck to paycheck is not just a function of having a particular type of job, and I find it's important not to let yourself be caught up in that what do you do socioeconomic comparison and keeping up with the Joneses that's been become such a norm, and remembering that everyone is living out their own experience, and so many people wear that mask and keep up this shiny facade and a trail of perfect life Facebook posts, but keeping in mind you mainly just see what others want you to see, and it's not productive to fall into that trap of, wow, their life must be so great, I want what they have, but knowing you know the grass isn't always greener and happiness is something you make inside of yourself and not just wishing what others have but being grateful for what you have. And there's a really beautiful quote I tell my yoga classes, it's not who you are that's the problem, it's who you think you're not. So be you, love who you are, start where you're at, and do the best you can. Hey Josh and Ryan, this is Andy from Portland, Oregon. I wanted to call to give you guys a packing tip. So I have done a lot of traveling in my life. I used to travel for work four to five days a week. Um, since then, now I just travel for fun usually. But one of the best uh, things that I came across to really minimize what I travel with is to pack in advance, to try to pack for my trip, 
a couple days and really lay out my outfits for each day, see what items I can mix and match. And then I put it all in the suitcase and I wait. And then two days before the trip, I'll go in and say, what can I remove? What do I not think that I'll need? I find that when I revisit my outfits or my planning, that it's easier for me to take out a couple excess items. I like to consider myself somewhat fashionable. So whether it's um, a bag or a pair of shoes or a shirt, I usually find that I can take out one or two items. This has allowed me to go to China and Russia for three weeks, both for fun and for work, all in a carry-on. Hey everybody, it's Joshua Fields Milburn. And I am Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are The Minimalists. Now, I was just looking up the dates for the second leg of the Less Is Now tour. So, so Ryan and I, we are in the middle of this crazy 40 city tour. We're doing a live talk about minimalism, an in-depth talk about minimalism. We're also recording a live version of The Minimalist podcast. We're answering a bunch of your questions in person. And, uh, oh yeah, and we dish out a bunch of free hugs afterward. Optional hugs. Yes, yeah, yeah. We do hand hugs too, if, it, yeah. if that's your thing. <laughs> Whatever you like, we were looking forward to seeing you on the road. You can head on over to lessisnow.com. But here's the cities that we're coming to for the second leg of this 40 city tour. We're gonna be in Canada again. Oh man, I can't wait, I love Canada. We're gonna be in Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton. But then we're headed to the east coast of the United States. We're gonna be in Philadelphia. We'll be in Manhattan and Brooklyn, two stops in New York wow. City. Wow, dude, you know, we've made it. <laughs> well, we've, we've never had a stop in Brooklyn, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll be in Salt Lake City, Denver, and Phoenix, heading over to the mountains. And then we're touring internationally. We'll be in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> we're uh, we're going to be in Austin and Dallas and Houston and then Nashville, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, and Tampa. We're finishing off with the South almost, but then there's no better place to spend December than in Detroit and Milwaukee. Wait, who told you that? <laughs> Our booking agent. <laughs> oh, perfect. Yeah, so we're going to be in Detroit and Milwaukee. That's where we're going to finish the Less Is Now tour this year. Head on over to lessisnow.com. You can get your tickets. You can find the dates, the theaters. And you can see us soon. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing that's just feeding your greed. Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it. Every little thing that you gotta have Every little thing that you gotta have You gotta reach for and you gotta grab Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it So tear your eyes away Or tear 